Welcome, everybody. It's really lovely to have you all join us. We still may have a few more folks join in. We had um, quite a few registrations. So um, we're really, really pleased with how much interest there is in chestnut trees and in, in Don's um, presentation today. It's wonderful to have you all join us. My name is Sarah Gladue. I'm the Director of Education for Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust. And I also oversee the um, citizen science monitoring projects. So just uh, a few uh, housekeeping sorts of things before we launch, I guess. Um, I will in a few moments mute everybody uh, except Don. <laughs> we'll let him speak. <laughs> uh, but you know, if you would like to ask a question during the program, Don has invited that especially clarifying remarks, you know, folks should just uh, raise their hand or put it in the chat or speak up even if they feel comfortable doing so to, to get clarification. This is not super formal. And, um, you know, if you put it in the chat, I can also help to facilitate and um, either um, check in with Don during the presentation and see if it's a good time to, to attend to that question. And if it's more of a far reaching question uh, that we wanna save to the end, you can put it in the chat and we'll revisit all the questions at the very end of his presentation and have some conversation around all of that. Um, if you are not familiar with Zoom as a, as a venue for this, um, on, the, on the top, uh, there's a view option that you can put your cursor over usually and you may be able to uh, see either different people or different sized people. And you can also um, pin one person. I recommend if you're gonna pin somebody, pin Don, uh, our presenter today, Don Davis. And um, that way you'll keep him on your screen. And even if other people go in and out, you can still see him um, as he uh, is, is discussing this with us. So that's one way to, to do it. Um, we're up to about 24 participants. We expect a number of other folks to be joining us. So um, if you want to put your question in the chat down on the bottom is this chat button. Usually you can put your cursor over, pull up a sidebar and put your question or your comments right in there. Uh, and then we can get back to it at the end of the presentation um, as, as needed. So I think that's about it, but I do welcome you. And if you haven't checked out Coastal Rivers Conservation Trust for additional programming, um, one thing that we are having in the near future is another Zoom presentation um, with a fellow who runs the uh, um, international beaver deceiver uh, company. And it's, he's gonna talk about beaver ecology and the importance of beavers and also about his work to both protect beavers and mitigate the um, uh, ways in which beavers and humans have conflicts, um, usually mm -hmm. around flooded roads and things like that. So welcome you to join us for that as well. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce Don Davis. I had the pleasure of meeting him only virtually so far, but maybe someday in person. Uh, he did a program for Eagle Hill and uh, it was about an eight hour program, uh, not all at once, but on chestnut trees. And uh, his excellent book on chestnut trees was part of the course, which was a great resource. And I encourage folks to check that out when they have an opportunity to do so. Um, at any rate, he was our, our instructor for that. And I found it really interesting. And I, I thought it would be um, lovely to, to invite him. So of course I've asked him to do quick in one hour, uh, summarize everything you have compiled, you know, so I, I didn't ask him to do everything because that would be too much, but um, to, uh, to find some, some parts that he would like to share with us is sort of a focus on the main audience here. I think we have um, a particular role maybe to play in, in providing hope for chestnut trees. So Don, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. No, oh, thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate you inviting me to do this um, talk today. I um, have spent the last 20 years of my life uh, researching and writing about chestnuts. So anytime I get a chance to, to do that with and share my information with other folks, I'm tickled to death. Uh, for those who don't know me, um, I was uh, 
the founding president of the Georgia chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation back in 2005 and 2006, and later uh, served on the um, American Chestnut Foundation board um, for a while, I was even doing some lobbying for the American Chestnut Foundation in Washington, DC. Uh, eventually, I had to follow my wife, who works for the World Health Organization uh, around the world. Uh, we spent some time in Tunisia, spent some time in Pakistan, and it looks like she's going to be transferred to New Delhi, India. So in April, I might be moving to, uh, to India for a while. I also work uh, part-time for the Harvard Forest, so I'm an official Harvard University employee. I work about 14 hours a week for them and post most of my information with them online on a weekly basis. Of course, most, what you're gonna, most of what you're gonna um, hear from me today comes from my new book, The American Chestnut and Environmental History. Uh, the book was released just last year it's about a 20,000 year uh, history of both the trees and the human, human interactions with the trees for the last uh, 10 or 11,000 years. And that's why we call it environmental history. So it's not just a natural history, it's also the history of people's relationships with the American chestnut. Uh, the image there on, on the right uh, was taken in 1909 in what is today the Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest. And if we have time later on today, I can tell you a little bit of story about finding those trees or what's left of those trees there in Joyce Kilmer. Of course, um, Maine features quite a bit in my book. Uh, this is the index to the book and you'll see that Maine gets quite a few mentions. Uh, in fact, the very first pages of the preface, there's Maine. I also talk about the importance of Maine being a, a regeneration niche. We're gonna get into that in just a few minutes. So, you know, the book covers a lot of territory and almost every state in the Eastern United States gets some mention or another. Um, one of the things that I struggled with when, when doing the book was to do a new range map. And um, this was a difficult task because one of the problems you have is like when to, when to do the range map. Do you wanna start 1500? Do you wanna go 1600? Do you wanna go earlier? And I really struggled with where to draw uh, the boundary, the Northern boundary in Maine, because there, there is some evidence that the trees were much further North in Maine uh, around 1500 or 1600. In fact, when you look at a map that was drawn in 1524, uh, this was a map by Esteban Gomez. He actually mentions a chestnut grove. He was Portuguese, so a castanal is Portuguese for chestnut grove, growing probably um, there east of uh, Macias Bay there in Maine. Uh, most folks think that's probably where the location of this site is. So you had trees growing probably further east than maybe my range map uh, indicates, but you also had trees further north. Um, this is a tough one because this evidence is based on a pollen study. Uh, according to the pollen study done by the individuals mentioned there on the slide, you started to see pollen from the American chestnut as, as early as about uh, 600 years ago, and certainly uh, by five or four, four or 500 years ago, you start seeing quite a bit of pollen. So that's for much further north than what I included on the range map. Um, of course, uh, the American chestnut was a latecomer to Maine. It's probably only been in the state for three or 4,000 years, um, moving from the south upward. Of course, chestnuts have constantly been over the, uh, on the move over their history. For the past 20,000 years, chestnuts have been uh, all over the place. Uh, if you went um, to the peak of the Ice Age some 26,000 years ago, you would find most of the chestnuts down in Northern Florida, Southern Georgia, Southern Alabama. Now, of course, at that time, at the peak of the Ice Age, Florida was much wider. You had much more land exposed because of the ocean shrank because of the Laurentide ice sheet. So water levels, ocean water levels were lower. You had more exposure of land. And that's where most of the chestnut pollen is popping up um, when um, paleontologists 
just uh, do their digs, they find chestnut pollen even off uh, today's present shoreline. So how do trees that were one day 26,000 years ago in the southeastern United States, how did they eventually arrive in Maine? Well, they got there from these particular chestnut movers or predominantly with these chestnut movers. On the left, you have the passenger pigeon. Passenger pigeons probably move chestnuts the farthest distance away. And how this happened is that, you know, you have literally tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of, 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 of passenger pigeons descend upon, you know, oak, oak chestnut forest and they gorge themselves and eat quite a bit of nuts. Um, some folks say they could eat as many as 17 acorns. Um, I think in the book, I, I sort of estimated possibly as many as 12 chestnuts. Um, the birds weigh about 12 ounces, but they had, a, they had a gullet that could expand to the size of an orange. So they would, they would eat all of these chestnuts. And then as they fly to their roost, they were attacked by certain predators, hawks, owls. And then when they found, when they got to the roost, they were attacked again. So you literally had dozens, if not hundreds of passenger pigeons that are full of chestnuts falling out of the sky or landing on the ground anywhere from 10, 20 or 30 miles away from where they fed. So there's some biologists who argue this is probably the only way that chestnuts could move northward at such a rapid pace is by these flocks of passenger pigeons that, that um, were gorging themselves on chestnuts. Of course, blue jays were also a great mover of chestnuts. Uh, chestnuts were, were moved approximately one to two miles, usually by blue jays. Uh, blue jays also have a, a special esophagus where they could swallow as many as five chestnuts, and then they would go to the site where they were going to cache the nuts and bury them. And of course, they don't always come back and, and, you know, re and collect the chestnuts that they buried. So this is how you get chestnuts growing in the forest. And one thing that I discovered when I wrote the book was that crows were probably a much more um, common mover of chestnuts uh, than we heretofore thought. Um, crows can cache lots of nuts. In California, they literally cache dozens, if not hundreds of walnuts. Uh, and I did find evidence of crows descending upon chestnut groves, particularly in the Northeastern United States. Of course, what I don't mention here are the other chestnut movers, uh, squirrels, mice, chipmunks, all of these things are moving the trees northward and they had to move northward on average of about 110 yards a year in order to wind up in Maine 18,000, 19,000 years later. So it's a fascinating process that, that you know, folks often think about trees as being sort of static beings, but trees are literally always on the move in terms of shifting and changing their ranges. Of course, um, Sarah thought it would be a good idea that I spent a little bit of time tonight looking at uh, American chestnut identification. Uh, for you folks who have been involved with chestnuts for a long time, this might be a little bit introductory for you, but uh, I'll try to make it as new and interesting as possible. First thing I need to tell you about the American chestnut, it's a tall, straight tree, at least in its prime, and it's in the perfect environment, in a wooded and forest environment. The trees grow incredibly straight, incredibly tall. And so that's gonna differentiate them from you know, a Chinese chestnut or a Japanese chestnut. These trees, by the way, were planted in 1910 in the Treverum Arboretum in Belgium, Brussels. This is a suburb of, of um, Brussels, Belgium. And, uh, this section of the Arboretum is literally called the Appalachian Highlands. So these trees have provenance. Uh, there's only about, uh, I think 10 or 12 left that they know were part of the original planting. And these trees grew to almost a diameter of four feet uh, in only 110 years. So they're really fast growers. Um, you're fortunate there in Maine to also have some very fast growing trees. So these trees are still alive. They're producing nuts. However, one of the problems with these trees is that you have European chestnuts in the vicinity. So it's difficult for them to cultivate pure Americans because of the back cross or the, the, you know, the hybridization that, that could possibly be occurring with the European chestnut. 
consequence. Second thing is the bark. Uh, American chestnut bark has these nice ridges. Generally, um, there's a twisting effect um, with the trees if they sprout from seeds. If you'll notice with these trees, you can see the slight twisting. That means they were grown from seeds. If the bark is sort of perfectly straight and parallel, that probably means they are stump sprouts. One of the things that chestnuts would do would grow from stump sprouts or coppice sprouts. And when they grew as coppice sprouts, they would be almost perfectly straight. And that's why the trees made such good telephone poles and telegraph poles. From a distance, the bark can look brownish, but up close, it's, it's clearly a nice gray color. Another thing that characterizes the American chestnut is these long, nice white catkins. Uh, these catkins can be anywhere from six to 10 inches. Occasionally, they'll get a little bit a lot larger or longer, but generally that's the range that you find them. When they first start opening from a distance, they're kind of greenish looking. Eventually they get, they get lighter and lighter in color, but when they're in their full peak, their full bloom, uh, they're almost as white as snow. In fact, a lot of um, the mountaintops in the Appalachians and the Southern Appalachians are referred to as, you know, Yellow Top Mountain, White Top Mountain, and that's because at one time, the chestnuts dominated the mountainsides and that from a distance, they, they often sort of resembled snow. Uh, they really did change the character of the landscape in many parts of the Appalachians. When you look at the leaves and stems up close, uh, you find that, uh, that um, the leaves are not as waxy. This is not really a good photograph to illustrate this, but Often a, a way to tell the American chestnut from let's say the Chinese is that the American chestnut has a nice soft texture. It's not thick and waxy. Stems tend to be reddish um, as, as they get older. This is a really young stem from a, a tree that's just uh, sprouted. Of course, in the fall, the American chestnut had a beautiful sort of golden uh, brassy look to it. And again, in the fall, you would have entire hillsides that would have this sort of brassy color. Um, I think I read somewhere, Brasstown Ball, which is the largest, the tallest mountain in the state of Georgia, got its name from the number of trees that grew uh, there. This was um, a possibility, at least I read at one point. To, uh, to tell the difference between the American chestnut and other uh, chestnut trees, uh, here's a nice sort of, uh, sort of uh, display of the leaves, uh, starting from left to right. You have uh, on the left side, the American chestnut. You have Chinese chestnut. You have the uh, European chestnut. And last but not least, you have the Japanese chestnut leaf. Here you're showing um, underside and front side, and then you also have the Allegheny chinkapin leaf there as well. The American chestnut also produced uh, uh, huge amounts of mast in the fall. Uh, one thing though that a lot of folks don't realize is that the nuts tend to be on the smaller size. Uh, the nuts generally are what I call quarter size and not, uh, I'm gonna advance a little bit more. The nuts there in the center, they're more, more likely to be size of a, of, a, of a nickel and not of a quarter. So I misspoke there. American chestnuts are more of a nickel size, whereas a Chinese European chestnut more of the quarter size. Going back here, here's a nice uh, uh, image showing you the difference between the American chestnut, the European chestnut, Chinese chestnut, and of course, uh, the Japanese chestnut. The size issue really uh, is relevant because the Japanese chestnut became so popular at the end of the 1800s, and it's the Japanese chestnut that actually brought the chestnut blight to the United States. Of course, you have other sort of native chestnuts, other castania species in the US. You have the Ozark chinkapin, you also have the Allegheny chinkapin, and in the middle, uh, you have um, sometimes what folks call Castania neglecta or Castania alabamasis. This is sort of a hybrid tree that is part Ozark chinkapin, part Allegheny chinkapin, and occasionally you can even have American chestnut haplotypes in it as well. So this is one of the problems that we have certainly in the southern part of the tree's range is all this hybridization that goes on between 
the various North American Castanga species. <clears throat> Here again is the image of the nuts, uh, Ozark chinkapin on the top. It's about dime size. They tend to be round. The American chestnut nickel size tend to be flat on one size. And then you have the Chinese chestnut, which is uh, as large as a quarter. Of course, I have to say a little bit about uh, Native Americans and chestnuts because the relationship between um, humans and chestnuts goes back at least 11,000 years. If you wanna learn more though about the relationship of Native Americans to chestnuts, you'll need to look at chapter two of my book because I spend almost the entire chapter looking at the relationship between um, the, um, the Native Americans and, uh, um, and the chestnut tree. Um, probably you, would, you could argue that the Haudenosaunee had probably the closest ties with the, the American chestnut, uh, what we used to call the Iroquois Confederacy. I'll speak about them in just a second. Of course, this image is an image, uh, is a mural painting, a watercolor mural painting that shows um, Native Americans in the Tennessee Valley uh, gathering and processing nuts uh, some 8,000 8, years ago. Probably at that time, most of the Native Americans that gathered nuts um, buried them in large silos. These are uh, sort of uh, just holes in the ground that could be uh, four or five feet deep. And uh, some villages might have five, six, seven of these silos filled with nuts, not just American chestnuts though, but also hickory nuts and acorns as well. As I point out in the book, uh, one Native American group, the Choctaw, even considered the American chestnut or the chestnut as the very first living thing that was brought forth by the creator. And both the Chickasaw and Nanchez actually had chestnut moons. So these were periods in which they celebrated uh, the, the, the gathering of chestnut, well, the, the gathering and eating of chestnuts. Uh, the chestnut moon generally was in February. So this meant that they were actually gathering the nuts in October, November, uh, preserving the nuts, drying the nuts, possibly smoking the nuts. And then they would later have a feast sort of celebrating the chestnut harvest in February. Of course, chestnut wood was also burned by Native Americans. Uh, however, uh, green chestnut and certainly chestnut that's not been properly aged tends to spark heavily. In fact, in many colonial households, uh, chestnut was not burned at all for that very reason because it's a fire hazard. In fact, the Iroquois Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee, actually forbade its use during official assemblies. And I'm quoting from the original Haudenosaunee constitution where it says, when the Lords are assembled, the council fire shall be kindled, but not with chestnut wood. <laughs> chestnut culture, again, if I had more time, we could uh, talk more about the, the relationship between chestnuts and American culture. Uh, one of the, uh, First things that folks usually want to talk about or, or discuss uh, has to do with um, chestnuts and the nut trade. Uh, the, the nut trade in the United States goes back at least to the late 1700s. I found examples of nuts being shipped even in boats from the Revolutionary War period. Um, of course, Native Americans were trading chestnuts well before that. Um, probably as early as the 15 and 1600s, in fact, in some, in some places. This is an advertisement that you see here that was uh, printed in a local newspaper in Providence, Rhode Island. This is one of the earliest advertisements I found when I was doing my research at the Library of Congress. There were a few earlier ones, but they were not uh, as well presented as this. This was printed in the Providence Phoenix on October the 18th, 1806. On the left, you have a nice image of a chestnut vendor. So between uh, the early 1800s and early 1900s, you saw this incredible market in chestnuts. 
uh, all over the Northeastern United States. Uh, chestnuts were shipped as far south as Georgia, all the way to New York City. Some chestnuts obviously made their way even as, as far north as uh, Portland, Maine. One of the most interesting quotes that I often use when I give talks about the American chestnut was printed just after the turn of the last century. And um, sometimes I even do a dramatic reading of the quote uh, because it tells you just how much uh, the American chestnut influenced um, the, um, the culture of the United States. Um, by, the late, by the late 1800s, you even had books written about the American, uh, you, had, you had novels where uh, the, the chestnuts were part of the theme of the novel. You had songs. I think I found at least four different songs that were sung about, uh, about chestnuts. So the, the chestnut was really an important part of the economy for a variety of reasons. So the quote that, that I have here, and, and I'm gonna read the entire thing, is, uh, is um, says that the American chestnut possessed a greater variety of uses than almost any other American hardwood as it touched upon almost every phase of our existence. The tree served as a shade and ornamental tree in our parks and estates. Its wood is used in the building and decoration of our houses and the manufacture of our furniture. We sit down in chairs made of chestnut and transact our business at desk of chestnut veneered with oak. We receive messages from the distance over wires strung on chestnut poles. We sit in a railroad train and read newspapers into whose composition chestnut pulp has gone. While our train travels over rails supported on chestnut ties and over trestles built of chestnut pilings, along a track whose right of way is fenced by wire supported on chestnut posts, on the same train travels goods shipped in boxes and barrels made of chestnut boards and staves. Even the leather in our shoes is tanned in an extract made from chestnut wood. At last, when the tree can serve us no longer in, can serve us no longer in any other way, it even forms the basic wood to make our coffins. Um, it also was used to make baby cradles. So clearly the American chestnut was a cradle to grave tree that was uh, used for almost everything imaginable. In fact, it would be hard to escape uh, seeing American chestnut products in anyone's home uh, by the late 1800s. Of course, sadly, we go from the American chestnut influencing al almost every aspect of our life to chestnut decline. I spend quite a bit of time discussing uh, chestnut decline uh, in the book. And uh, I think I'm one of the few individuals to sort of have a smoking gun and exactly sort of documenting which nursery or nurseries was probably the one that brought the chestnut blight to the United States. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on that too much, um, but I do wanna, talk about a few important um, happenings when it comes to the chestnut blight and its arrival to the United States. Sometime around June or July 1904, Hermann Merkel, he surveyed the grounds of the New York Zoological Park, otherwise known as the Bronx Zoo. He actually did so because some of the maintenance workers told him that they had seen a number of blight uh, injured trees. Uh, of course, they didn't use the term blight. They just said some trees are dying and he checked them out. He just sprayed the trees with a common fung fungicide. Next year, the following spring, he asked William Murill of the New York Botanical Garden to inspect the dead and dying trees. Murill, who was a noted mycologist, said he couldn't identify the disease, but he recommended spraying the infected trees, all 438 of them, with a Bordeaux mixture. This was sort of a common fungicide of the, peer, of the period that everyone sort of used. Not very, uh, the, the fungicide didn't do much good. And in 1906, Mural publishes this account that appeared in the Journal of the New York Botanical Garden. This was published in June, 1906. And at this point you can see, he says, this is a serious disease that needs to be taken seriously. And in September 1906, that same year, he names the fungus Diaportha parasitica. 
1978, the tree would, the, the fungus would be renamed as Cryphonectria parasitica. Um, so, you know, the fungus hits pretty quickly, does lots of destruction quickly, but its movement is not quite understood, or at least, you know, a lot of folks say, you know, the blight hits New York City and then it moves on average 50 years southward and expands southward. And by such and such period, the blight has covered the southeastern United States and the eastern United States. But that's not exactly true. Here you have a map that was done as early as 1911. And what you see here, I'll have my pointer, you can see these little dots. Every single dot here is an infection of the chestnut blight. So as early as 1911, the blight was already found in central West Virginia. It was already found almost in Southwest Virginia. When um, asked about this, some of the scientists say this is not surprising because almost every one of these locations had orchards with Japanese chestnuts in them. So this is how they sort of eventually sort of figured out that the smoking gun here with Japanese chestnuts and it was the Japanese chestnut that was bringing the blight that had brought the blight to North America. I also find this map interesting and this looks a little bit almost like a hurricane swirl effect. And there was, by the way, a hurricane that hit New England just prior to 1904. The main event. I don't have a whole lot of time and I wanna have time for Q and A, but I did wanna to speak to this whole issue of Maine and what Maine can possibly do in terms of chestnut restoration and uh, you know, helping us protect these trees and possibly reintroduce them into the Eastern deciduous forests. And um, hopefully with some folks in the audience who probably know more than me about some of these trees. I've been to Maine several times. I went to Gutter College in Vermont, but I don't spend enough time in Maine to keep up with sort of what happens with these trees from a sort of month to month basis. In any event, in 2015, there was a large, healthy American chestnut tree discovered in, in Lovell, Maine. At 115 feet, it was considered the tallest blight free tree in North America. However, this image doesn't really show this. It was only 16 inches in diameter in 2015. This tree had replaced another tree in Hebron, Maine, that in 2012 was had previously been considered the tallest American chestnut in Maine at 95 feet. Another tree in Arona, Maine, topped out 115 feet, um, but I think that was measured back in 2021 or maybe before 2021. In any event, in 2021, it actually had the blight. And I'm not sure if it's status. I think there's some discussion about maybe it being a co-champion with the level tree. But in any event, this is the level tree now. So in 2020, this tree had grown much larger than even the Hebron tree and measuring some 2.2 feet in diameter. It um, is also thought to be much taller than it was in 2012, rising to a height of 114 feet. Uh, my guess is that it's even taller today. So we've had, you know, at least one growing season. Um, so it may, may have topped out even higher than 115. Because of its larger diameter and crown spread, uh, as you know, to have champion tree, tree status, you look at diameter, you look at height, and you look at crown spread, and those three data points are, are uh, factored into coming up with champ, champ, uh, champion tree status. And as far as I know, unless again, we have a co-champion, this tree in Lovell is the current largest American chestnut in Maine. Another reason that Maine could play an important role in the future of the American chestnut has to do with global warming. Uh, this map shows that if we have a two to three degree rise in global temperatures over the next 50 years or so, that the optimal range of the American chestnut could shift northward. And by northward, I mean all the way into Nova Scotia, into Newfoundland. 
Now the data assumes that, you know, you don't have chestnut blight killing off trees. So again, it assumes that if the chestnut tree was alive and there was no chestnut blight, the range in terms of, you know, temperature and rainfall amounts and all that would be conducive to the American chestnut growing this far north. So the top data, the top map is 2030, the middle map is uh, the range in 2015, and the lower map is, is the range of the American chestnut in 2080. Uh, and that's, however, if you have a, an increase in um, global temperatures of at least 4.5, or, or you have the greenhouse gas co concentration uh, of 4.5. Another thing that you find interesting about the trees in Maine, and again, I'm gonna put this in quotes, uh, the Maine trees are more pure, in quotation marks, in that when you look at the haplotypes, the DNA haplotypes of the trees in the Northeast, they tend not to share DNA haplotypes of the other Castania species. So in the Southern part of the range, a lot of the trees are, uh, um, you know, show past crossbreeding with you know, alligating chinkapins, Ozark chinkapins. Some trees even have Ozark chinkapin uh, DNA um, and alligating chinkapin DNA. So this would be another reason I think that you should pay attention to the trees in Maine is that uh, they, they, they tend to be uniquely American. <laughs> and it makes sense because, you know, when you had the, the, the ice age and the trees started moving southwards, those trees in Maine would have been the last trees to arrive in Florida. Conversely, when the, when the climate starts warming and the trees start moving northward, they're the first trees to move northward, right? So it's easier for them to become isolated and they wouldn't have to necessarily crossbreed with the other Castania species. Another reason that I think Maine could play an important role in chestnut restoration is because of something we call Phytophthora cinnamomai, a water mold that was previously classified as a fungus, but now is placed in the kingdom Chromista, or sometimes known as uh, uh, Strominopila. Uh, this uh, disease has sort of a local name or a common name as ink disease, and that's because it tends to make the roots of chestnut trees uh, turn ink black, as you see here in this image. It kills chestnuts quickly. Um, there are some treatments uh, for it, but in general, it, in, in warm, warm climates, it causes 100% fatality in most trees. Um, Maine has yet to get Phytophthora. Of course, if the weather keeps warming, it could make its way there. But right now, Maine is safe from this tree. As I point out in the book, between 1825 and 1860, a fourth of the range of the American chestnut was obliterated from Phytophthora. That's a huge area. So when we talk about restoring chestnut to its former range, it's going to be really difficult because Phytophthora really can only be sort of obliterated from the ecosystem by extremely, extremely cold temperatures. So is there hope for, for chestnuts? Back to the original question. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a half full kind of guy. So I'm going to say, well, I'm going to hold off for giving you my definitive answer, but I'm going to say I'm, I'm optimistic partly because there's so many American chestnut trees out there today. Now there is some anecdotal evidence that this map is not quite as accurate as it may actually be because this is data from 2010. So every decade or so, the US Forest Service does an inventory of all the tree species out there in the forest. And they meticulously document basically all the stems. They do have some sampling methodology. And this map represents the number of chestnut stems per square kilometer. That's a lot of stems, guys. That's 400 million chestnuts that could actually be surviving in the eastern woodlands with some 8.5 million trees, three inches or more in diameter, and as many as 2.5 million trees that could be blooming size. If you look at the map, you'll see that in the Great Smoky Mountains area of North Carolina, East Tennessee, you have lots of chestnut stems. If you go north, you'll see that in Western Mass, you also have a little pocket there 
Let's see if I can move my cursor over there. You've got a nice little pocket, lots of chestnut stems there in Western Mass. And of course, up and down the Blue Ridge, you're gonna see high numbers of chestnut stems. I was talking to my old buddy, Ralph Lutz, who wrote one of the nice articles on chestnuts in Virginia. And he has anecdotal evidence that some of these areas here in Virginia, in the southeastern part of Virginia, the trees are not re-sprouting from the stump sprouts. What that means is that instead of them re-sprouting once they die back, they're not. So he's a little bit worried that we're losing some of these chestnuts. Of course, uh, you also have folks breeding blight resistant, blight tolerant trees. Um, in the mid 1980s, Gary Griffin started something called the American Chestnut Cooperators Foundation, ACCF. Uh, they've been uh, trying to grow blight resistant American chestnuts um, in various orchards uh, throughout uh, Southeastern uh, United States. Um, by 27, they had uh, as many, they distributed as many as 160,000 nuts to their members. And in 29, they claimed they were, that about 10% of the progeny in some of their orchards were dem demonstrating some levels of blight resistance. Um, Lucille and Gary Griffin, who run the organization, uh, are not as active as they used to be. Uh, their membership isn't quite as active as it used to be, but uh, they're still doing some work. And when I um, when I tried contacting them lately, they said, we just don't have a lot of time to, to, to deal with folks because we're out there in the woods all the time. Of course, the American Chestnut Foundation uh, is doing a lot of work regarding chestnut restoration. Uh, they've been doing um, chestnut restoration work now for um, four decades. Um, they've um, sort of perfected this back cross breeding program that you see here. Basically the back cross breeding program involves crossing Chinese chestnut trees with American chestnut trees. Those offspring are then bred back to American chestnut trees. Of course, as this is happening, you're also inoculating the trees in order to see which trees have uh, blight resistance. In any event, over time, you, you eventually you create a tree that's 94% American that has some levels of blight resistance. Uh, as some of you may know, a lot of these trees, literally thousands of these trees are, are planted at the Meadowview Research Farm down in, down in Meadowview, Virginia. And of course, there's literally thousands more of these trees planted on public and private lands. Uh, lastly, more recently, uh, TSCF is involved, has been working with uh, the geneticist William Powell. Uh, he's a SUNY ESF um, geneticist who has been breeding uh, genetically modified trees for blight resistance. Uh, these trees are monitored by USDA's Animal and Plant Inspection Service, otherwise known as APHIS. That's the federal entity that has authority over regulating the trees. Uh, in January 2020, Powell filed a petition with APHIS asking them to deregulate the GE tree. Uh, in response, um, the USDA has um, decided to conduct a, a full-blown environmental impact statement, which will be published in draft form uh, maybe earlier this year. I think it's probably more likely to be in 2023. There will be a public comment period and at that point, the federal government could begin to de deregulating the tree. And if that happens, the trees would be the first uh, GE trees released into the wild. Some of you may know that I've gone on record, at least I discussed this in my book, as opposing the tree's premature release into the wild. As in my opinion, I don't think we quite know enough yet about how the tree will respond to the blight uh, and the surrounding ecosystem. Um, still not quite convinced. In fact, this is the tree here, um, and you can see, yes, it does form a canker, it does form over the tree, at least up to this point has survived, but you're not seeing, you know, a, 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 you're not seeing like a good healthy looking tree that one day could be used for lumber, so on and so forth. So to, to end my talk, is there hope for American chest, uh, hope for chestnuts? My answer is a qualified yes. The tree, uh, the tree really um, performs invaluable ecosystem services. It fed, it housed us, it employed us, 
and employed us. So I think to fully abandon chestnut restoration is uh, somewhat irresponsible. I mean, I've had debates with some friends of mine who believe we, we should just give up and throw in the towel and let sort of uh, evolution take its course. But I think the tree was important enough to the Eastern deciduous forest that we should, we should do what we can to try to bring the trees back. However, I do believe that it should be done. Chestnut restoration should be done as carefully as possible, that we should not harm the genomic heritage of the iconic tree. And we also should keep in mind, this is something I point out in the book, that whatever restoration path is taken, the full return of the trees is gonna take a while. I mean, it's gonna take a long time to get the trees back into the forest when they're reproducing themselves, perhaps centuries. Well, one study said that it could take as much as a millennium. But however long it takes, I think you guys in Maine will no doubt play an important role in the future of the American chestnut. So I really hope that if you're active in chestnut restoration, you'll keep at it and let's see what the future holds. So I think I'm well out of time, gone over my time, but I'll stop there and we can do Q and A. <clears throat> oh, that was wonderful. Don, take a breath. That was tremendous, thank you. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah, so if, if folks would like to um, converse, by all means, unmute yourselves and, and speak up. I will lead off here a little bit. Um, Anne had an update, has an update for us about the Orno tree that it was cut down a couple of years ago. So um, I didn't know that either, and uh, it's uh, unfortunate. Um, and Anne also continues, um, and I actually just emailed for my 10 free seeds, but um, new members of the main chapter of, of the American Chestnut Tree Foundation will get 10 free chestnut seeds while supplies last. So if anyone's interested, there you go. Incentive, um, as if there wasn't enough already. So, mm -hmm. um, and, um, and Michael asks, are there secret chestnut forests maintained in the national forests? Well, there are plantings that they're trying to not let the public know where they are. Um, and that's, you know, for obvious reasons. I, I, I don't know if this is anecdotal or, or what, but I, I seem like there was some reporters a few years ago where they said, okay, we're going to take you and show you these nuts, but we're going to have to blindfold you and drive you out in the middle of, you know, the Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina, and we're going to then show you the trees. Um, so, you know, there are some these test plantings on our national forest. And I think, uh, you know, for good reasons, it's not, you know, it shouldn't be made too public where they are. Um, these are the advanced hybrids, um, the advanced hybrid tree. Thank you, Don. Um, Don Osier uh, mentions that there's a small chestnut nursery at the Viles Arboretum in Augusta, um, which I have visited as well. And um, incidentally, there's also, um, there are a small collection of chestnuts um, and they are producing uh, seeds um, at the Salt Bay Farm, which is part of Coastal Rivers property in, in Dermascata. And I also know that there are some um, in Camden at the, uh, oh my goodness, just slipped my mind, but say it again, Anne. Mary Spring Garden. Yes, thank you. Mary Spring. Yes, Mary Spring Nature Center in Camden also has, um, I'm, if I remember right, somewhere around 15 or 20 trees. Mm -hmm. Yes, those, those are hybrids. The ones at Mary Spring are hybrids? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you might be interested. There's also uh, large trees in Camden at the Harkness Preserve which are having trouble with the blight, but uh, they, they're probably uh, a foot in diameter or more. Been there quite a while. Mm -hmm. I think those may be gone, Roger. They're all gone? I think so. Uh, they might, uh, people might also be interested. Chestnuts are already being planted for a long time in uh, the maritime provinces. I uh, got a list of chestnuts growing in uh, uh, up there. One of them is about uh, 24 inches in diameter. And I recommend if you get to uh, Halifax, uh, go visit it at the Univlaki uh, 
the state. Uh, it's uh, really impressive. And uh, there are a few hundred of them growing throughout uh, uh, Nova Scotia. Unfortunately, they have the blight uh, up there too. So uh, they'll grow a lot wider than the map showed, but uh, mm -hmm. they're gonna be fighting the blight. We, we find uh, in Maine, uh, uh, people growing chestnuts as far north as the Canadian border at Jackman and uh, uh, Eastport, but uh, the blight uh, is moving not only in the chestnuts, but it's in the oak trees. So, so though, mm -hmm. if there's oak trees, you, you got a problem with uh, blight. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, there is a... Um... There's a comment from Libby that there is a planted orchard just south of Bath that she ran into by accident. And um, Ron uh, says hello from the Canadian Chestnut Council. He's very much enjoyed the presentation. He says we're at a F3 level of breeding resistant pure American chestnut here in Ontario using our uh, native resistant trees in the wild. We also have trees in all the maritime provinces. Excellent. You're welcome. Excellent. Thanks That's for joining us, Ron. Great. Interesting. It is amazing how how far flung these trees are growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a nice band of chestnut on the northern shore of Lake Ontario historically. Really nice band. Uh, there, I mentioned it in the book. But they may, the, the percentage of all trees was pretty impressive. It, is the Chinese chestnut fully resistant to blight? And if so, is there any scientific? Uh, do you know any scientific reason why it's what 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 makes it resistant? You know, that's a great question because even the Chinese trees gets blight and occasionally the Chinese trees will die of the blight. So, um, you know, to say that a Chinese tree is fully resistant is not exactly accurate, although most Chinese trees do tend to survive it. They form a nice, the canker forms, they're able to, you know, continue and live. Um, but the problem with the Chinese tree is its form and stature, right? If we want a tree that's, that looks and walks and talks like the American chestnut, we need to minimize the number of Chinese genes in it. So that's kind of a dilemma that, the, that we have now is how to, how to have a tree that has as many American you know, chestnut genes in it, but also has the ability to repel the blight, but not so much of the Chinese genes <laughs> that it changes the form and shape of the American tree. So that's kind of the dilemma of, you know, it could be that to have a fully blight resistant tree, the trees can only be 94%, 92% or even less, 88% American chestnut in order to fully repel the blight. Um, I have a question a about uh about the blight, that last picture that you showed of the tree, I assume that that was blight on the tree. I have four chestnut trees and one of them has, in, I'm in Nobleboro, um, Maine, and uh, one of them has serious blight and it has, and I've, it's had it for a couple of years. I just didn't know what it was until a couple of minutes ago. I missed the first part of your talk, I'm sorry. And it, I, it has also spread to two oak trees too. Two young oak trees have the same blight on them. Should I cut those down and get rid of them? Um, not necessarily. I mean, it could be that your chestnut tree is going to develop a natural, you know, resistance. Um, has it gotten worse? Is it, does it look like it's going to kill the tree? Yeah, it's getting um, worse, and the top of the tree is is uh, is not, is failing. Yeah, yeah, it's probably maybe too late at this point. Yeah. Um, did you see the telltale kind of orange-looking flecks at any point? little orange spots around the canker? Yes, yes. Okay. Yep, now that you mentioned that, I remember seeing that a, a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's been there about three years, maybe four years. Yeah, it's probably too late at this point for that tree, but. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question, would you discuss the importance of the chestnut tree to wildlife? Uh, yes, uh, one of the, 
subsections and one of the last chapters of the book is entitled uh, a banquet table for wildlife and that comes from a quote the very first ranger of the great smoky mountains national park talked about there were so many chestnuts in the great smoky mountains that it literally uh, they pr they provided this banquet table for wildlife and the number of species that you know really were dependent upon the chestnut is just incredible. Black bear, white-tailed deer, rough grouse, raccoons, squirrels. The Allegheny wood rat, which is, a, a, which is an endangered species, was probably dependent upon the chestnut. And if we really want Allegheny wood rat populations to return um, to their levels of several hundred years ago, we're gonna have to bring the American chestnut back. Their middens were literally just packed with not only chestnuts, but the burrs and the, you know, the chestnut leaves. They, they really uh, utilize the chestnut a lot. White-footed deer mice, chipmunks, um, you know, just an incredible number of animal species. And uh, I discussed this in the book, just how many species declined in number uh, when we lost the chestnut. Um, it was a funny story about a man in the Smokies who killed a wild turkey that had 97 chestnuts in its swollen crawl. Uh, so certainly the wild turkey was a chestnut dependent species. So this is why I tend to argue with some of those people that oh, we should just let the American chestnut go. We, we should just you know let it take its evolutionary course. We're gonna spend so much money in trying to bring it back and it still may not come back. But I said, yes, but it had so many benefits to our ecosystem that we should give it, you know, the best shot, uh, that we shouldn't give up on it just yet. Not no, to mention, not, not to mention, um, and I discussed this in the book, when American chestnut limbs would fall into a stream, the chestnut wood would not decay, which meant the, the, the stream would the, 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 the limbs, because they're not decaying, would for, form these nice little pools and eddies, which were beneficial to fish, all, all kinds of macroinvertebrates. And a studies done like 50, 60, 70 years after, after the blight still found that these streams had chestnut wood in them that were performing these very particular ecosystem services. And a lot of the caddis flies and the various, you know, insects that lived in these streams also fed on the chestnut leaves. So there's lots of different ways in which the, the American chestnut benefited the ecosystem. In fact, most of the forests that had been formerly classified as oak chestnut later became oak hickory. And if you guys know anything about forest, oak hickory forests are more xeric, more drier than oak chestnut forests. So literally you could argue that the the whole character of the ecosystem changed with the loss of the American chestnut. At least I would argue that there's some parts of the forest that became much more xeric and drier because we lost the chestnut. And it's partly because the chestnut leaves were providing nitrogen, were providing all these things in order to keep the soils moisture and also uh, you know, encouraging the growth of certain microorganisms and other types of plants. Actually, I didn't find, uh, you know, some people argue that the American chestnut was allopathic, that its leaves would kill certain species, but I found it only killed or only inhibited the growth of two or three, four different species. And that for the most part, it was really no more allopathic than, you know, scarlet oaks and uh, other species, that it really didn't inhibit the growth of a lot of different plants and organisms. <clears throat> Don, I'd like to ask you, was the uh, chestnut trees wiped out of the coastal plain and the Piedmont because of uh, uh, root rot rather than yeah. blight? Because root rot came about 100 years before. Exactly. Uh, That's exactly right, Roger. The the Phytophthora probably entered into the, the ports of Savannah, Charleston, late 1700s, probably was getting into the local area, early 1800s, but you don't, you know, you don't start seeing the evidence to 1825, but it's a slow moving pathogen. So that means certainly late 1700s, early 1800s, it was impacting the coastal area. And it's also coming up from Mobile Bay in Alabama. So getting up into Mississippi and Alabama. So it's moving slowly northward, and by 1860, 
literally one fourth of the range of the American chestnut is uh, sort of wiped out because the organisms in the soil and no trees can really grow. Of course, it did miss some areas. As you know, Jimmy Carter, who grew up in Plains, he had chestnuts growing up as a boy. So Phytophthora does jump around. Uh, one of the things I discovered is that cotton plantations and you know, planting cotton fields and, and that sort of thing uh, sort of enabled the, the, the root rot to spread more rapidly across the landscape. Um, so there are certain reasons why sometimes Phytophthora did bypass some areas in the Southeast. Another thing though that, that I documented was uh, late spring freezes. Uh, my job in the Harvard forest right now is, is really documenting what we call mega climate events and how they impact forests. And we find that uh, certainly in, during the little ice age period from you know, roughly 1700 to 1850, you, you had these incredible late spring frosts. So in May, it would get well below freezing and that would literally wipe out you know, acres and acres of trees. The American chestnut was probably wiped out over thousands of acres during some of these late spring freezes. And I document this uh, in the book as well. So you had Phytophthora, you had late spring freezes. Of course, you had clearing for agriculture. You know, there were all these different things uh, that were impacting um, uh, the American chestnut. So even before the blight hits, there were, you know, there were issues and problems with it. Thank you. That's great. And um, back to this um, orchard and bath, uh, Libby notes that it's a collaborative effort between the American Chestnut Foundation and the Nature Conservancy for folks mm -hmm. who might be interested in visiting that or learning more about it. Um, and she says it's in the Basin Preserve, which actually I'm not familiar with, but bears, bears checking out for sure. Thank you, Libby. And um, Jim asks, um, if you have a blighted tree and, it, and it's taken down, What's the best way to dispose of the wood at that point? Um, probably burning it if you can. Um, okay. They were doing that. The Pennsylvania Blight Tree Commission um, back in the um, teens, actually, that was the big thing that they recommended doing is cutting down, cutting down all infected trees and burning them. And do they do they recommend a, a stump or root treatment at that point, or is it? Well, at that point, they were actually burning the stumps and coppice sprouts too. <laughs> oh, really? Because they, you know, they tend to grow back as you know stump yeah. sprouts. Um, and the back then, the blight was hitting the coppice sprouts, and they said this is bad because we're just sort of encouraging the blight. So they would go back and burn the stumps and, and coppice sprouts as well. And they were also uh, cutting down um, nearby living trees, which I thought was a big mistake, but that was their policy. So they were literally cutting down and burning tens of thousands of healthy trees that were within the zones of the infections. Yeah, so we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to learn about any resistance that might exist in right. any of those trees. Yeah, yeah, you know, if one in 10,000 trees has some sort of natural blight resistant, we would not know that because the tree was removed from the gene, gene pool, so to speak. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. And also something that maybe we need to um, take into consideration because with, with other tree species and other diseases mm -hmm. uh, and invasive pest yeah. management mechanisms too. Yeah, the, the brood X also hit about the exact same time. So there was just, it was almost like the perfect storm. <laughs> you had cicadas attacking chestnuts. You had a lot of fire damage. Uh, throughout the Northeast, people, uh, you know, literally forest fires. Uh, there was just lots going on in the forest. So at that time, the forest was not very healthy, uh, you might say. I think in Maryland, um, this forester, his last name is Zahn, Raphael Zahn, he discovered that it was only, there was like less than 5% of all the trees in Eastern Maryland were actually seedlings. Almost every tree was a coppice tree. And some of the trees he found had been, they were, you know, fourth, fifth, fifth generation chestnuts. They were coppice sprouts that had come back four and five different times, been, you know, grown and chopped off, come back again. 
So he, he sort of predicted, this was actually before the blight, that, that the trees were just in a not, not a very healthy state and that they were gonna be prone to certain diseases. I think he even used the word fungus, even not knowing there was a fungus you know, entering the US at the time. <laughs> Yeah. Great. Well, it's been a fascinating program. I really appreciate your time and, and all of the folks who've joined us on a lovely afternoon. Could have been walking in the woods um, and maybe you still will. It's, it's uh, that time of year where there's still light right now. So mm -hmm. it's great. Even in Maine, there's still light. <laughs> um, I'll be happy to stay on if folks want to talk to me one on one. Uh, I'll be happy to stay on as long as uh, folks have questions or comments. Any questions? Uh, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Dan. Michael's just saying he's sorry to leave us. He needs to drop off, but thank you for a great program. And uh, Ken is also saying thank you. I have one more question. Uh, I'm the one that had the blighted, one blighted tree out of four. Uh, and the other three have never had a single blossom on them uh, or another or a fruit on it. Mm -hmm. Is that unusual? Well, and they all the, have tree, a the tree needs nice sunlight in order to produce yeah. blossoms, and it can take anywhere from five to 10 years in order for that to happen. So if your tree can live somewhere between five and 10 years, and oh, it's yeah. exposed to direct sunlight, then, yep, it, yep. then it may produce some blossoms at that point. But you have to keep in mind, in order for it to produce nuts, you need a nearby tree that's also blooming. So you yep. have to have two trees in order to produce viable nuts. Yeah, yeah. the four trees uh, uh, are probably at least 15 years old and they all have about the same amount of sunlight. It's uh, from the west. They are, are on two sides, there are tall pine trees, but uh, they have a, a west exposure. But the, the three trees have never done anything and it's just the one that's blighted that was ex loaded with fruit uh, and for, I don't know, the last five, seven, eight years. Um, hmm. is that and unusual? you had no one, come and, and no one come and look at the trees during that time? Well, yeah, so a couple of people came and looked at them, but they didn't even recognize the blight. So they obviously didn't know what they were talking about. So with chestnut trees, mm -hmm. uh, so. Mary, Mary, you might consider mud packing the uh, anchor. Uh, we've been successful in Maine in saving some trees that way. Uh, that gets the uh, uh, organisms in the ground, uh, which, which you wet then and put on the canker, and it kills the blight. Now, you got to be uh, pretty uh, persistent to do that, but we've had people in Farmington uh, who save trees, I know, that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, this one, the top of its beginning is, is going. So oh, yep, I, I think I, I waited too long because I didn't know what it was. So mm -hmm. yep. I don't know if it, it's true with your trees, Mary, or, or chestnuts, but some, some trees, uh, many plants, in fact, will hurry and reproduce if they're being attacked by something. Uh -huh. So, you know, the stress can induce um, mm -hmm. the fruit, the flowering and the fruiting in many trees just because they know they need to procreate if they're going to fade out. Yeah. So I don't know if that could be related. No, it's, I, I think you're, you're right. You tend to see this. Uh, usually the, the year after they bear nuts and fruit, they, they die. If not yeah. the following year, certainly within a year or two. It seems like right. they expend all their energy producing the nuts and then, and then they die back. Yeah. Yeah, the squirrels got most of the nuts. So um, I, I don't I don't think I have any from that tree anymore. So <laughs> they're very well, that's efficient. great. Your your tree served a wonderful purpose while it was here. <laughs> and who knows, maybe 50 yards, 100 yards away, you have some little seedlings growing that you don't know about. Yep. Good point. Henry David Thoreau, I have a whole section in the book about he he loved to go out in the in his woods and look for the little seedlings. And he mm -hmm. said all the seedlings had to be buried by a squirrel or a little a little field mouse or something that uh, brought them there. <laughs>
I'll keep an eye out for him. <laughs> well, we had a number more th thank yous in the chat. Is there uh, any closing comments you want to share with us, Don? Things we should think about in the future, and then maybe we'll uh, wrap this up. And well, I, you know, I um, I hope at some point folks will have a chance to to look at the book. Uh, it's it's um, gotten a few good reviews on Amazon.com, but I got my very first international review the other day. Um, it's a very positive review. It's in a magazine called. Um, Sportsman Classics. This is an international magazine that, that sort of um, hunters and fishermen read. It's a very slick, glossy magazine. And the guy who wrote the article is actually from the Great Smoky Mountains. And what's interesting, he had all these positive things to say about the book, but one thing he said, he said, I don't believe your statement about passenger pigeons. There's no way that a bird that's 12 ounces could eat 12 chestnuts. <laughs> and I, and I, I thought, about that why did he say that and it, it is true uh, passenger pigeon weighs 12 ounces but that's when i looked up that the the the, the thing about the the crawl of a passenger pigeon could swell the size of an orange and by the way 12 ounces is not a small bird a, a morning dove only weighs like four ounces mm -hmm. so a passenger pigeon is like three times larger than a morning dove so it has a crawl that's the size of an orange and it really could swallow that many nuts, right? And so if it flies 20 or 30 miles, it's attacked by a hawk, the bird falls dead to the floor. And even if it's eaten, the nuts are probably not eaten and that one or two of those little nuts is gonna sprout and grow. So that's how the trees were able to move so fast, you know, northward. But he, did, he just, he took exception with that one. <laughs> that one part so I thought that was interesting that um that it's it's really hard for some people to imagine that something like this could actually happen in nature but apparently it did yeah yeah that's that's a great great and congratulations on, on such a successful uh bunch of reviews that's great yeah. wonderful all right well Thank you again, right. Don. Thank, Thank you, everyone, who joined us. Have a lovely evening.